Imagine a space where everything is available to you. No external authority can dictate what you can or cannot purchase or what information can be exchanged. Does this sound like a haven for freedom or a nihilistic nightmare? Well, technology allows such a place to exist, the deep web. Lying beneath the World Wide Web with Facebook and Google and YouTube, the stuff that we use every day, is a gargantuan amount of data. This stuff isn't uh, seen by normal search engines, so it can be bloody difficult to navigate. You have to know where you're going in the first place. But many entrepreneurial minds have seen the benefits of such a space. Away from the uh, usual constraints of government censorship or control, and with the ability to anonymously and securely host websites, it has become home to those people who want to sell illegal products and services. I'm just going to show you some of them now. Here's an assault rifle you can buy on the internet. A dedicated site for UK passports with the uh, name of your choice. Counterfeit US dollars in exchange for bitcoins. This is a site that holds the personal data of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of individuals. The uh, highlighted example there is Arnold Schwarzenegger. The red skull and crossbones, meaning it contains his uh, social security number. It probably contains his uh, phone number, previous addresses, uh, date of birth, that sort of thing. This is a crowdsourced hitman market. Users nominate someone who they think should be assassinated. Other users put money into a pot, and then it's hoped that the hitman will come forward and complete the hit and redeem the reward. I know. There's also jihadis, hire a hacker, and hire a hitman in a more direct fashion. So how the hell is all of this possible? Albeit still on the deep web, it's on the internet. Well, as I said, it's all about technology, and there's a few at play here. The first is Tor, comes in two parts. Tor is a browser like Google Chrome, Internet Explorer, Mozilla Firefox that you have to use to get to these sites. And then there's a much broader Tor network, which is a series of volunteers, computers, and internet connections, which when you log on, takes your internet connection, pings it through three different points, shoots out the other, uh, out the other end. This disguises your IP address, which then can be linked to your physical location. But it's been disguised. It's gone through these various filters. So with Tor, you can anonymously browse and host websites on the internet. The other part, this uh, yellow logo, is the now infamous cryptocurrency Bitcoin, which allows anonymous exchanges of what well, is essentially money uh, across the internet. And then you also have uh, message encryption, which at the moment even the NSA can't break. And this is what I use to communicate with my sources. Um, but all of this technology is free to use. There may be a slight learning curve, but once you get over that, you can explore and utilize the deep web to its full potential. So why should you listen to me? Um, well, for the past six months, I've been reporting from the deep web for Vice and some other media outlets. And I'm also working on a, uh, I'm part of a team working on a documentary of Vice and the BBC on the deep web's most infamous website, the Silk Road. This is where users can buy drugs and various items, which I'll go into. But although there are dozens of websites where you can buy drugs, the Silk Road is the most resilient. Here's an um, artist's representation of the logo. Silk Road gets its name from the ancient trade routes uh, in between Europe and China. And as I said, it mostly sells drugs. LSD, MDMA, 90 to 95% pure cocaine, cannabis, and a lot more esoteric ones, such as DMT, the incredibly high-powered hallucinogen, and also uh, suicide tablets, although they haven't been on for quite some time. Vendors typically list their items in the eBay sort of fashion, and then you log on the site, choose what product you want, send your bitcoins, and they post your product in the post. Um, considering how many users are on this site, the seizures and arrests are incredibly low to negligible. Unfortunately, this is what users of the site saw when they logged on in October 2013. The FBI had taken over the website and arrested its supposed owner, uh, a man called Ross Ulbrich, who you might have heard of. However, the forums, the, the administration, the staff, and the drug dealers 
or vendors that they use to communicate uh, was still operational while the site was down. But the communications were completely erratic, completely chaotic. From a public looking in, no one had any bloody idea what the hell was going on. A few weeks pass. It looks like the deep web's most successful marketplace has disappeared. But then this happens. <laughs> a collection of users from the original site band back together, and obviously to the annoyance of the FBI, the NCA, and various other uh, law enforcement agencies, they make a new site. Uh, most people in the media have been calling it Silk Road 2.0, but they kind of just refer to it as uh, Silk Road. So this is what the website looks like. When Silk Road 2.0 launched, I was invited, along with the drug dealers, to have a look at the website, see what was going on, and check how it compared to the original site. At the moment, there's somewhere between 13,500 and 14,000 individual listings for drugs. And the most popular drug is a $9 ecstasy pill from the Netherlands, primarily because of its price and because of its purity. Here's a close-up of a LSD tab available, for, well, a selection of LSD tabs available for sale. Uh, the price is typically higher than what you're going to get on the street, but that's because you're paying for a superior product than you're going to get from a street dealer in East London. If you can read this, this is kind of the reviews, and the one at the bottom, very good stuff. You can bet I'll be ordering more really, really soon. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I can't quite remember, but I'm pretty sure this was for black tar heroin. Um, <laughs> sorry. Because of this review structure and almost user-generated feedback, only the strongest dealers survive. If you don't provide strong customer service, a good product, and good communication, someone else is going to beat you. So as for who's behind the Silk Road, this gets a little bit messy. This avatar is the dread pirate Roberts, a character from the book The Princess Bride. Some people know it. In The Princess Bride, the persona of Dread Pirate Roberts is handed down. Its title is handed down from person to person. So if the individual dies or leaves or whatever it had be, the ideology, the lineage can continue. And this supposedly is used in the same fashion on Silk Road. This title has been passed on from one person to the other. However, I say it gets messy because it was confirmed, at least with the original Silk Road, multiple people had access to the Dread Pirate Roberts account. So it's not in quite a linear fashion uh, as it is with the Princess Bride. Now, everything I just said to you may not actually be news. I mean, Gorka reported on the Silk Road in 2011. And ever since then, the mainstream media has been swarming around the deep web. However, the main point that I want to tell you about is that coverage has been completely superficial. It's focused too much on the bad guys selling drugs. I want to show you that behind the pixels of an avatar on a computer screen, there are people with motivations and goals and aims, just like everybody else. My first example, there's a book club on the Silk Road forums where users go, they have a reading list, they debate the literature, and then they move on to another book. Two examples here, uh, the chaos theory and anatomy of the state. I don't want to force political affiliations on these people. I mean, they should speak for themselves. But for the sake of this, if we have to, neo-libertarian, anarchistic, ultra-capitalist. But this idea of liberty plays a great part on the Silk Road ideology. You can't sell anything you want on Silk Road. You'll be banned. You'll be removed. You can't sell anything that will directly harm someone else. No knives, no guns, no explosives, no child porn. No organs, which is nice, obviously. So I want to show you that there's something more behind this. They're not just these people selling illegal weapons. They are making a moral decision. Now, you may think these people run a digital drug empire. They're just in it for the money. I don't think that's true. This is an article I wrote for Motherboard in April of this year, how Silk Road bounced back from its multi-million dollar hack. Uh, where I spoke to the administration who I'm in constant contact with and various other staff members. So in February, the Silk Road was hacked. They lose $2.7 million worth of Bitcoins. Now, and since then, the staff of the site haven't been paid. What usually happens when a product is sold on Silk Road is that a commission is taken out and that's paid for the staff. 
fine, just like any sort of normal commission job. What's been happening now is the commission goes out, but it goes into a pot, which is then randomly distributed to a victim of the hack. As of April, 50% of the hack victims were paid back of this $2.7 million, and they hope to pay back everyone by mid-June, and um, perhaps sooner. Again, you still may be thinking this could be a PR strategy, this could just be a ploy. Well, again, I don't think so. And here's a quote from uh, Dr. Clue, who's one of the staff members that I'm in contact with. We have before, and are even now, working countless hours doing what the American federal government considers to be illegal behavior, for no pay at all, in order to keep this movement alive. Why would we face years in prison for free? Money means more to the governments that pursue us than it, do, than it does to those who are being pursued. Now, don't get, don't get me wrong. Obviously, there are casual users of the site who just go on, buy drugs for themselves or for their friends. But at least a few members of the administration and the core user base approach it differently. They have this um, ideological impetus. Here's another example completely different. This is Fernando, a Spanish physician who runs harm reduction programs in the real world. When he's not away from keyboard, he's in the Silk Road under the pseudonym of Dr. X. Here he answers impartial questions about drug use. What happens if I mix cocaine and alcohol? What happens if I mix this opiate substitute with alcohol? What happens if I mix this opiate substitute with alcohol, with LSD, with cocaine, and then maybe I'll have a bomb of MDMA afterwards? As well as this, he runs a drug testing program aimed specifically at users of deep web websites, not just the Silk Road. Users will buy their product, say, cocaine advertises 85% pure. They'll send it to Dr. X. He tests it for its purity, sends it back, and then the uh, user can make an informed decision about what to put into their body. They can decide if they, want to risk, if they want to take the risk of that particular drug, or if they would rather get a product somewhere else, or not take the drug at all. Now, let's leave the Silk Road behind us for a minute and talk more about other sites of the deep web. If you remember that site I just showed you earlier that had the personal data of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you may think that's a pretty dark website, right? But the hacker behind it actually has a really interesting morality. He took over a, another website, which was hosting links to child pornography. He wouldn't give back the site until they removed these links to child porn, and he was successful. This war on pedophilia within the deep web has been echoed by other groups, such as the Hacking Collective Anonymous that you might have heard of. But if you haven't already read it, here's the quote from the hacker who, who got rid of the child porn links. In one move, I did more to limit child porn access than all the Twitter pedo hunters of the last three years. What have you done today? Of course, the deep web can still be a dark place. I mean, it hosts child porn, right? But the deep web, at least morally, is not dark. It's very colorful. So to return to my question, is this a haven for freedom or a nihilistic nightmare? It's definitely not the latter. These people are free to do whatever they want because of the anonymity protections provided by technology, but they don't. They make explicit moral decisions. As for the future of this space, it's only going to get more accessible and more uh, popular. Ever, ever since the Snowden revelations, People who want privacy are now in abundance, whether that's a journalist working in Syria, a corporate whistleblower, or someone who just wants to browse the internet without having all of their habits documented by the NSA and stored in a database. I said it's also going to be more accessible. That's because the people behind Tor Project are going to make it so anybody with basic technological literacy can set up a website on the deep web. So that could be a blog, or yes, it could be another uh, drug selling website. Another advance in technology is the rise of decentralization. If you remember that Silk Road was taken down because the FBI found a server and they sent a legal request and then they uh, seized the server. With a decentralized network, there is no server to seize. The files hosting the website are distributed all over the planet. There is no way you can take down the website. And now that applies to jihadi forums and child porn websites, but it also applies to the next WikiLeaks or to the next journalistic medium. In sum, away from the morality, 
more and more people are going to take the plunge into this deep web. Thank you for listening.